Hello, folks. Um, so I am here with my virus. I've got a stinking cold, but that's quite appropriate for today because we're uh, we're going to explore the intersections between ourselves and other species. Um, so I've got a, a lovely, sticky, slightly disgusting uh, warm up for us. Um, so the things I just need to give you a heads up about are the fact that um, obviously I sound like I'm full of a cold and I'm sorry about that, um, but I don't think it's going to be fatal. <laughs> and, um, also the fact that my internet's a little wibbly wobbly because I'm, I'm not at home, um, but I think I've got a better connection now. So. If I'm breaking up, um, maybe drop me a line in the chat. I think that's working pretty well. And if needs be, I'll switch off my video just to free up a bit of bandwidth. But I think this is I think this is going to work OK. Um, so where are we going to come at this from? Um, I think there's a there's a there's a real issue for us in thinking about ourselves as nature poets. Um, or writers about the wild world, which is a very important and precious thing to do. Um, because sometimes we can fall into the trap, um, all of us in our everyday lives or in our making, of, of forgetting that we too are part of the natural world. We're, we're animals too. Um, and every so often we're reminded brutally <laughs> that we are indeed subject to all the same beasties and bugs and plagues um, and intersections of species as, as everyone else. Um, and I am here to prove it. So um, I thought it'd be fun to start um, with that thought of intersections with a bit of a warm up. But actually I'm gonna get Lindsay um, to save my voice a little bit and read a poem uh, for you because I think it's a really beautiful example of a piece where the speaker in the poem, the writer, a mother um, of small children, runs up against other species in a really exciting and, and kind of recognisable way. So I'm just going to set up a screen share for you, Lindsay, and everyone should be able to see this, I hope. Um, Lindsay, I'm going to do my best to scroll down um, without it being too jolty for you. <laughs> Uh, share screen. Oh, could you enable screen sharing for me, please? Oh, yes, sorry. I'll blow my nose while you do it. All right. I told you it was going to be disgusting. I think that should be you, okay? Okay. Can you see that all right? I can, yes. Yeah, yes. I can get this a little. So when you get to drown out the news, I'll scroll down. Okay, thanks. Protection. I was so tired, I thought the pigeon was a rat. For a second, grey against the pebble dash under the washing line, and I nearly dropped the pot of hot potatoes. But no, just a bird. Get a grip. Feed the kids, I told my furiously mashing hand, while the radio was saying that our lives will leave a skim on the planet, like the skin of an onion, only made mostly of plastic. The day's crop of nappies lay in juicy packets of guilt by the recycling, and my toddlers drowned out the news. Rain called me out to race against the sky, the pegs, the time it takes to topple from a high chair. Then a sparrowhawk thumped down, ripped through the pigeon and mantled her food, wings like a skirt spread over blood. She stared straight at me. Her eyes were black night ringed by sun. The stillness between us was the axis of galaxies, but I had to run back inside to spoon mash into hungry mouths, brain burning with the hawk stare, a sudden seeing of the endless hunger we call life. I cloaked the children in comfort and they slept, oblivious to my unravelling, warm bodies I could kill for. I fell asleep on the clothes pile and woke from dreams of wings to a dull dawn, the feel of feathers in my mouth. Yeah, thank you so much, Lindsay. It was a great read and really good. Um, so I'll just stop the share there. Uh, 
Perfect. Thank you so much. So you can see the intersection there, just everyday life, climate concern, worry about the environment, plastic nappies, children, and this hawk, this sparrow hawk out of nowhere on an on a bird so ordinary that we might not notice it. Um, we might not notice a pigeon in our daily lives because we see so many of them. And, and through that, the, the speaker feels the wildness in herself. Um, I think it's a really exciting poem, actually. I really like that one. So I, I don't think we need to discuss it too much. I just kind of wanted to set the scene a little bit. Um, but I do have a warm up for you. So you need your pens ready. Um, I'm going to give you about oh, five minutes to think about your own body as an ecosystem. Um, so you probably know that um, in the in the body of a, a fully grown man, for example, of, of average kind of weight, there's maybe two to six pounds um, of bacteria. Um, so, so much of our bodies as other species, um, there's creatures living on our skin, um, all over us, in our bodies, in, in all the cracks that we don't think about, there's fungi and bacteria and viruses and all sorts of interesting beasties. And it's actually very hard to parse out what is us and what's them. You know, the borders are very entangled, which I find quite exciting, actually, because as long as everything's in balance, then that's part of our health. And when things are out of balance, that's our lack of health. Um, so each of us is a zoo, really. Um, so take a moment and I'd like you to imaginatively visualize your body as an ecosystem. And then I just want you to write one line um, and I want you to describe just one part of your body in this way. So you can maybe reference a kind of landscape or you can talk of, I don't know, herds of mites galloping across a, sav a savannah. I'm not sure where you want to go with it. Um, you can go inside, you can stay on the surface. It's up to you. So five minutes, um, I will get you back at 17 minutes past, but I'll just um, let you know when the time's up. OK, just all you need is one line.
do you know, I said all kinds of good things just then. <laughs> and you didn't hear any of them. What a shame. Um, okay, I gather there's about 10 folk out there. Um, mind, I can't see you. Um, but I'd love to hear some of your lines. So, um, Lindsay, I'm wondering if folk could let, let you or let us know when they're ready to share. And when you've shared your line, could you also type it into the chat, please? So we've got a, a copy of it. That would be great. Thank you, Atlas. That would be wonderful. Right, Atlas, I'll just make you allowed to talk. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Okay, this is my line. A day without brushing and my teeth are forested in the cavernous city port of my mouth. Oh, yum. <laughs> It's so sticky and so delicious. The city port is great. That's wonderful. Atlas, could you pop that in the chat, please, so we've got a record of it? Okay, I will. Thank you. Who's up next? Oh, Sally, I'm going to... Oh, yeah, that'd be great if you read it. Hi. Hey. Okay. Hey. In the mountain range of my knuckles, the bacterium clamber like goats past patches of fungi clung to the crevasses of my skin. Oh, this is so exciting. It's like some kind of... Gulliver's Travels event, isn't it? <laughs> That's wonderful, Sally. Thank you. Thank you. Who's up next? I'm expecting about 10 landscapes. This is very suspenseful. <laughs> I wonder, folk, do you need a little bit longer, maybe? I can't, um, because I can't see you, I can't see where you're at in your writing process um so just just give me a heads up in the chat as to where you're at and what you need Oh, B, that's exciting. You've got a whole stanza. Can we have it? It'd be nice to hear your voice if that's possible. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm it's, I can tell you as much about bacteria as like other parts of the ecosystem. You know what I mean? Like, um, I'll just keep it in. So, my arms are the wings of a bird, a great tawny eyed bird. 
with feathers like steel, lifting with colors. Quail. I think I caught most of that bee. Um, it was it was quite crackly, but I think I did hear a few images. Um, I can type it in the chat. Yeah. But I I love the um I love what that adds to the poem that's kind of um, accumulated in the chat here. You've got the the tiny the tiny big in, in Sally's knuckles, and then we zoom out and see these magnificent arms that are bronze and golden. I think. Um, so yeah, pop it in the chat. And if anyone's a little bit reluctant to um, to speak out, that's absolutely fine. Please do use the chat to type in a, a line or two. And we're going to move on in a second, but I just... Oh, Kathleen, I'm stuck like a tick under the sock cuff on my left foot. <laughs> <laughs> Employ the chat. I mean, you can sort of, you can sort of see the the poem um, accumulating there. I think it, it's sort of writing itself in a way, which is really exciting. So I'm maybe just going to leave that open as a as an opportunity to you through the rest of the session. Um, I know fine that sometimes you write something really quickly, and sometimes you need just a bit more thinking, dreaming space, and that's okay. So. If you want to just plop something in later on in the session, uh, that's absolutely fine. But uh, Lindsay will maybe try and the, the, the chat will automatically save, won't it? Because it's recording. So so we will have the we will have all the work together. and We can maybe um, pat it together into a, into a group poem later. OB, there's your there's your lines. My arms are the wings of a bird, a great tawny eyed bird with feathers like steel, glinting with colours, oil. I love that. That's great. So folks, I think you probably get the get the point. <laughs> um, I'm going to move us on to another exercise. Um, I have to buzz off at quarter two, so I want to make sure we've had a bit of a range of exploration before I go. Um, Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Atlas oil on its own. It's it's lovely and unexpected. Um, oh, Dumfries Academy, you've got something nice. The migratory microbacteria who daily take the arduous, I can't say arduous, did they? Arduous trek from the ground beneath my feet to lay their lazy and effectual selves on the beds beneath my nails. Yeah, you get the sense of scale with that again. I think the rhythms in these lines are really beautiful, actually. They're very lyrical. I remember that from the last time we met, actually. Wonderful. So we're gonna we're gonna try a slightly different perspective now. Um, I'm gonna play you a recording of a poet uh, reading her own poem, and it's a poem in praise of a giraffe, and it's quite long. Um, but very beautiful. And she wrote this poem because there was a giraffe in a zoo um, that was euthanized because he didn't have the, the genetic diversity that they would want to breed from, uh, which is obviously really, really upsetting. So apologies in advance if that makes you feel sad. But I think the poem is a wonderful thing because it praises him and hymns him and imagines a whole um, complex history through time um, of his life, almost as if he was a sort of a, a super giraffe that had lived for centuries. Um, so I'm gonna play you that because I think it's, again, it'll save my voice, but also it's really lovely to hear a poet read their own work. Um, so I'm gonna do a screen share and share my sound. Um, or was I gonna get you to do that, Lindsay? Is that gonna work better, do you think? Well, I'll give it a go. Yeah. Um, yes, that might save your. Um. So, so I'll play the audio of it. Yeah. Is it worth me giving it a go? Because I think my internet's better actually now. Yeah. Give it. Give it a go. Yeah. It's working okay, isn't it? Um, yes, it's much better than it was. Yes. Okay. So, if we get stuck, I'm going to hand over to you. Yeah. The the poet here is Lucy Brock Broido, and the poem is just called Giraffe. Um. Here's the screen share coming up. Yeah, we need to share sound. 
oh, why won't it let me do that? That's very vexing. I wonder why it won't let me share sound on this occasion. It always lets me share sound. Right, um, Lindsay, I'm going to get you to give me a heads up if this isn't clear enough when I play the audio, OK? And I'll, I'll scroll down the poem as, as she reads it. Giraffe. In another life, he was Caesar's pet. Perhaps a gift from Cleopatra when she returned to Rome. Her hair salty and sapphire from bathing. The winged coal around her eyes, smudged from heat. In another life, he was from Somalia, where he spent hours watching clouds in shapes of feral acrobats, dipping along their tight ropes, spun of camel's hair and jute. His eyes were liquid, kind his lashes each as long as a hummingbird's tongue, his fetlocks puffed from galloping, his tail curled upward from the joy of feeling fleet across the tinted grasslands and the gold savannas there. Do you find me colorful as well? Once, in another life in the Serengeti, he stretched his neck to feed on the acacia twigs, mimosa, wild apricot. He was gentle, and his heart was as long as a human's arm. At night, the others of his species hummed to each other across the woodlands there. No one knows how exactly to this day, but you can hear their fluted sounds. Pliny the Elder wrote that in the circus of the hunting theaters of ancient Greece, he would be safe. He was considered among the curiosities. The house of the Medici found him novel, and he pleased them mightily. Do you find my story? pleasing too. Even on the ship to France, the sailors cut an oblong hole through the deck above the cargo hole to allow his head to poke safely through. When he arrived, they dressed him in royal livery to walk the 700 leggy kilometers from Marseille to Paris to be presented to the queen who fed him rose petals from her hand. Thebes, in the tomb of the Valley of the Kings, he was depicted in a hieroglyph, his forelegs gently tethered by two slaves with a green monkey clinging to his neck like a child just along for the ride. Do you think I have imagined this? In a woodblock once, in an early Netherlandish world, he is shown with a crocodile, a unicorn, and a wobbly man with a tail and prehensile feet. Once, in Khartoum, he bent his neck low enough to take milk from a pewter bowl held by a Sudanese farmer's son. Centuries later, in Piccadilly Circus, he was excluded from the carousel. Everyone favored him, but no one could climb that high. If you come back from the other world to this, the sky in Denmark, in its reticulated weathers, is inky on most days in February now. In the Copenhagen Zoo, they only name the animals who grow old there, and in this life, they called him Marius, but he was just a two-year-old. In that moment, was he looking at a gray cobbled steeple in the middle distance of a dome, 
or thinking of a time when his life was circled by a mane of warmth in the bright Numidian sun. His belly was full and his eyes closed slightly, his lashes casting long pink shadows on his face. Do you think I made this up? The attending veterinarian, Mads Bertelsen, shot him only once. He needed badly to be culled. His genetic type and character replicated quite tidily enough already there, said Bengt Holst, director of the zoo. On that same day, after mid-noon tea and biscuits at their schools, the Danish children were ushered to the habitat in the gardens so they could learn firsthand about anatomy. The keepers cut him open to reveal his neck, his tongue, his heart, which weighed just shy of 20 pounds. The children wound in down, bound in bright wool scarves, which covered their open mouths with horizontal stripes, were mittened, wide-eyed, curious. Do you find me curious as well? When the Nordic dark settled in so early, the children, blanketed in white, began to fuss at sleep and cry. It would not snow that night. What is it in me makes me tell you of these sights? There we go. So it's a long poem. It's a lot to take in. Um, and, and some of it's quite hard to take, I think. But on the other hand, I think it needs to be so long because it, it needs to praise the giraffe and it needs to it needs to bring him to notice and cherish his life. So I've got a couple of uh, conversation opportunities for you folks. Um, one thing you might want to do is just um, contribute something in the, in the chat, or you might want to say something out loud about anything you noticed in the poem or how you feel about it. Um, and the other opportunity is to share the thing that you find most wonderful about another species. So I'm going to go for it. Um, I asked some eco poets last week here at the Act War the same question. And my co tutor, who's a wonderful poet called James Goodman, said that when he was eight, he was so obsessed with badgers that he cut all his fingernails into points and he scrabbled in the dirt and he ate worms, which just delighted me. And um, excuse me. He said that he loved badgers so much that his, his parents took him to a special badger reserve in, in the south of England. Um, I don't know whether they were planning to leave him there or what, but I loved that story. And I think my the thing I find most wonderful about another species, oh, there's so many things. Um, I think the fact that um, Arctic terns, um, which come back to us in Shetland in the summer, they spend a couple of months with us breeding in, in summer. Um, in their lifetime, um, every year they make a migration between the Arctic and the Antarctic, give or take, um, which is obviously very far. And they live for 50 plus years, something like that. So apparently in its lifetime, an Arctic tern travels the same distance um, as we would travel if we went to the moon and back to earth and back to the moon again, which is really amazing, I think. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a few minutes for discussion here and for ideas and inspiration. Has anyone got anything they want to chip in? Have you got a favorite species? You can include humans.
Sally, I would like to know more about echolocation. Do you want to say anything? Well, honestly, I don't really know much, right? I, I just think it's really cool. <laughs> like the fact that they can, you know, bats and whales and stuff, that they don't, even though their eyes might not be as good as ours, they can like almost maybe see better than us just using sound. But yeah, that's so wonderful, isn't it? I've got a friend with a bat detector and one night we sat out um, waving the bat detector wildly around and you could tell which species of bat it was by the frequency of their uh, clicks, is it? Or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's very, very cool. And Dumfries Academy are saying, temptingly, dinosaurs. I would like to hear more about dinosaurs, Dumfries Academy. What do you like about them? What is it that captivates you about them? Well, B saying she really loves manatees because they're so big yet so gentle. They are lovely, aren't they? Kathleen says whales for how long they've been around and their big hearts and curious eyes. They have very human eyes, whales, don't they? If you if you look into a whale's eye. I also um, saw a very large cod at my neighbor's house once. Um, and its eye was so big. <laughs> it was it was like that. And it apart from the size, it looked like a human eye. And Atlas is saying that wolves' sense of smell is as important to them as sight is to us. And I think senses are really interesting with other species because we really, um, most of us, many of us, end up kind of defaulting to our dominant sense, which is the sense of sight. Um, so it's really interesting to try and hone your other senses and, and pick more stuff up. Each is also a wolf fan, Atlas. <laughs> There's a pack of you out there, that's really nice. I like all the uh, the less considered creatures as well. Like I'm really into snails, actually. I think they're very wonderful. And I'm a gardener as well, so I have every reason not to like them. But I just, uh, I like the way they move very much. I'm just gonna mute myself and blow my nose dramatically, folks, but keep your ideas coming in. Sally, have you ever felt a have you ever felt a snake? Have you ever held one? Yeah, I actually have. They feel so cool. <laughs> but it's really surprising. Can you describe <laughs> the feeling at all? It's it's weird. They're really like smooth, and they like when they move. It's like you're just moving. Like it feels like they're just constantly moving, and it's like it's almost like you're not holding. A solid thing it just moves so smoothly yeah I thought that it's a long time ago I I held a what was it a python maybe not a very big one um it was so cool and it was like a balm on my skin almost the way it moved mm -hmm. over and and I know what you mean that kind of constant restlessness yeah. Atlas says I love how pigs will revert back into wild boars after one generation if they need to. <laughs> That's great. I like the idea of reverting if you need to. I think that might be something that's available to all of us. <laughs> and actually, I do think that um, sometimes I think that necessity is what drives us to shapeshift. I still, I'm still sort of keeping an open mind about human shapeshifting. I think maybe we Maybe we do yeah. and can if necessary. Has anybody got any favorite creatures that are, as they say, less charismatic? Obviously, there's there's a lot of um, there's lots of kind of public drives to support wonderful polar bears and wonderful puffins, and they are precious precious creatures. Um, but sometimes I think we forget about the humbler beasties. Does anyone want to champion 
something that has a species I think has been overlooked. BI would like to see that as well. I'd like to see a spider's eggs open. Crows are great. Ravens are also great. If you can make a convincing enough raven sound, they will talk back to you and you can have a conversation. It's really nice. And did you know that ravens quite often fly upside down when they're displaying, they, when they're showing off to each other? I think it's maybe a trick to show each other how clever they are. They'll be flying along and they'll flip in midair and then they'll go perfectly back to horizontal again. Newts are adorable and no one ever talks about them. That is true. I love newts as well. I really would like to see a puffball grow from the ground as well. I've seen a I've seen a ripe puffball, but I've never seen one appear. If I knew where one would uh, pop up, I might camp out by it, but they're so sudden, they grow so fast. Has anyone got any favourite plants? What do you like about Ivy, Sally? <laughs> I think I just like the way it kind of clings to stuff as it grows. It's kind of like blankets things. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? And those um, those strong, strong veins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lindsay says, I do love a dung beetle. <laughs> I do love a dung beetle too. I see you've popped up Dumfries Academy. Did you want to chip in with something? Maybe not. Okay, that's all right. I've just decided to make you all able to speak. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's a really good idea. Speak away. Well, folks, I'm gonna I'm gonna dash off. Um, unfortunately, this is this is a short session for me, so I'm gonna hand over. Um, to my wonderful colleagues, but I'm going to give you a wee task before I go. Is that all right, Lindsay? Is that does that work? If we set for the writing task, um, so this is going to be a longer write. Um, but Lindsay, I know you've got some other things to speak about today, so I'm going to let you decide how long folk will write for. But I'd like you to think a little bit more about those uncharismatic species, and it doesn't need to be something in your immediate ecosystem. So. Um, it might well be a woodlouse or a slater, as they call them in Shetland. Um, by the way, I discovered yesterday that my plum is terrified of spiders, which <laughs> made me laugh a lot. But you must meet so many of them. Um, so yeah, think of a think of a species that that maybe doesn't get enough attention in in your opinion, and it might be um, just because they're tiny, um, even microscopic. Or it might be because we're so used to seeing them that we've maybe forgotten to value them. It might be because they're super ugly. Um, not all animals are cute and beautiful in our eyes. They probably are to each other. Um, <clears throat> so think of a um, think of a, an uncharismatic species, and would you please write um, a praised poem to it and honour it in the way that that poem uh, to the giraffe did. Um, and I'll look forward to encountering some or all of you again soon. I hope you enjoy your writing. Thank you very much, Jen. We'll let them get on with it, but I hope you feel a lot better soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye bye.
think how much time have people got to write this one? Did we see a time? Uh, no, let's see. Uh, what is it? 47 now. If we, what about another four minutes? We lost one or two, or are they just. Yeah. B's not there. Kathleen. <clears throat>
Jolly good. Atlas, I think. You're finished. Everybody else? Uh, ready? Atlas, would you like to share what you've written? I think I need to... Yeah, you need to unmute, Atlas. I'm happy to read it out. That would be lovely. <laughs> The fly, who flies, glinting like dragon's bones, who wanders the evening and ventures the forbidden places, who is grave-born and marrow-suckled, whose wet nurse is the reaper, and who carries the thoughts of the dead wherever he flies. The fly, who loves the brown banana peel and worships the apple core, waiting in the compost. The fly who is the sanitizer, the soap of the world, feasting it clean, one picnic at a time. Oh, <laughs> uh, we are having a very sticky afternoon, aren't we? <laughs> oh, quite. That's wonderful, Atlas. <laughs> I love the way you you um there's the there's this sort of disgusting element of flies that the reason we don't like them and that you turned it into such a useful creature as well. They are conflicting. <laughs> so thank you, Sally. Have you got something you would like to read for us? I've not really got anything. <laughs> I wrote a few things and then kind of deleted it, but no, I've not really got anything. What about what was the what was the creature that you were thinking of? I was thinking of a fly too, actually. <laughs> um, we haven't we um you haven't put anything in the chat. I'm just wondering if it, what animals you or what creatures you decided to concentrate on. We have one poem. Would you like to read it aloud? Because I have I have um I think you just need to unmute yourself. Greenland sharks, oh, fantastic. Would you like to read it aloud? And bats, but that one isn't finished. I, we, we're, we're happy to have unfinished um, poems as well. Uh, I mean, you've, you've not, got, it's, we, we give you a very short period of time to do these things, so. Um, or do you want to uh, post it into chat? Oh, you, you do, H would like to read. Um, I think you should be able to read if you unmute yourself. Hi. Hello. Hi. Right, so my one's the one about sharks. Great. Down into the icy depths I plunge, my breath stolen from me by sharp pins. The hiss of my mask and wash of the current are the only sounds in my ears. Ahead of me, darkness. I'm swimming in ink. Suddenly, from the everything and nothing lit by my halo of electric light, it comes. She is gentle, floating in an empty vacuum, like the ancient predecessor of an interstellar satellite. Mummified by centuries of brine, its definition warmed to nothing by time and the beating of the ocean, like sea glass and soft shards in your palm. She looks her age. Greenland was named in the, eight, nine, in the 980s, by Iceland's Eric the Red. Since then, barely two generations of his oldest sharks have left the ocean. Well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's outstanding. Oh my goodness me, I was really right down there with you. You really yes. felt the coldness and the depth yes. and the darkness of that one. That was wonderful. Yeah. Could you, um, and Atlas, could you post those poems into chat by any chance so that we can all have a wee look at them? Thanks so much for that. That was amazing. Amazing. You obviously know a lot about these Greenland sharks as well. That would be great. And what about the, the um, one about bats, the one that's unfinished? Would you like to read that one? She would rather not. That's fine. That's fine. If you wanted to um, 
paste it into chat then we could all have a look at it but um enjoy finishing it when you when you have time what about b have you uh, managed to finish it b or get or get to a stage where you, you're happy to read it to us i could read she says she could write b i'm going to i have to slightly change things for you because you've got a slightly different system i think you should be hi hi b um yeah, so um, I apologise to start with for anybody who's arachnophobic. Um, I did mind about spiders. Um, you are repulsed by me, my reckless glory, my eyes like seven failed moons, the soft brush of my skin. You recoil when you see me hanging by a thread of starlight, spinning and twirling as if I was a dancer, then retreating back up my tightrope. You dread me, the touch of my arm on your face, my kiss of gold and promise, yet there is venom on my lips. That's another wonderful poem. Thank you very much for those. That was that Thank was you. Fun. Well done. Well done. Anybody else got anything you would like to read? Catherine, have you been busy writing? I couldn't possibly read what I've written. <laughs> <laughs> not having heard those ones. I know we're not meant to feel that way, but really, I wrote a, a ditty, basically, about, about the dung beetle, which you mentioned. <laughs> And it's unbecoming of me to, to really, no, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I, I think that, uh, that was a, um, is everyone, anyone else uh, would like to, to read? Um, I think. Anyone else like to? I don't want to miss anybody off um, the chance. Okay. Well, I think um, I think we'll we will move on to the the final bit of the final webinar. Um, Catherine, as you can you can see, Catherine and I have been sort of managing the series on behalf of Stanza, just thought it might be useful to have a bit of a chat if you've got any questions about um, the mm -hmm. next stage. I know that she talked you through um, the, the process of submitting your work um, so that you will be considered for further mentoring by Jane. I hope she's better by then, poor soul. Um, uh, and just wondered if any of you had any questions you wanted to ask about that and whether um, we're we're very much hoping that you will uh, you will have a go. Um, it is unfortunately open only to people in Scotland, so Atlas um, is not uh, <laughs> he's not able to enter, which is a shame. But I've, we've so enjoyed your contributions, Atlas, that um, uh, it's been lovely having you on board. Catherine, is there anything you want to add? Um, well, it's really more if people have any questions at all. It's um, you you know that the well, if you've looked at the um, the information and the guidelines, the closing dates the twenty third of December, um, midnight on the twenty third of December. But uh, so if you can get your entries in by then, it's between two and six poems in in total. You can you can submit, right? So no fewer than two, no more than six. Um, up to 20 lines per poem. And that's about it, really. I mean, it's anything at all. It's, it can be inspired by, obviously, what's been talked about and what you've been doing over these last um, webinars, 10 webinars, or any of the webinars you've attended and you've, you've watched on, on YouTube. Or it might be something completely new, completely different. But I have to say that, that so many of you who are here and have been attending, you've completed some amazing sounding pretty much finished poems during the, the webinars themselves, I can't see that the, you won't have quite a, you know, a difficult choice to make as to what you will submit, you know, because there's been such wonderful things that we've heard. So I certainly, you know, wouldn't be concerned about you not having 
anything to submit. But um, does anyone have any questions at all about about what how it might work or what how it might work afterwards as well with the the mentoring, which we can't tell you quite so much about because Jen's not here, but we can certainly um, perhaps talk to you about that a little bit. Do you know how many mentoring sessions there would be? To be absolutely honest, Sally, I'm not sure how many there would be, um, but I think probably um, a couple, certainly. I think it's... I'm yeah, sorry to be a bit vague on this because we weren't involved with last year's. I think it's one individual each, and which would be a 20-minute session, and then it's either one or two um, group sessions mm -hmm. for the, the six who are who are chosen. But, you know, so that's that's my understanding of it. So, yeah. yeah. So it's a short one to one. Um, and a, a couple of group sessions. Mm -hmm. And then um, the chance to do a reading at the Stanza uh, Poetry Festival in March. Um, again, Catherine and I were, were not there last year, but uh, we were at the reading at the Wigtown Book Festival in September, and some of you were readers there. Uh, B and Beth were there. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to present. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's nerve wracking, but it's a great opportunity to present your work. Uh, that's B saying last year, I think it was two group sessions and then a few one to one. All right. I there'll be quite so many one to ones in that case, but maybe there'll be two one-to-ones as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Not a question, but there's the poem. Thank you. Oh, wow. Oh, fantastic. These are... I forgot what they are again. What's the title of this one? This is, it was Green... Greenland Shark. Greenland sharks, that was it. Yeah. Not yeah. green sharks, Greenland sharks. Thank you for that. That's great. I'll send that to Jen uh, later this evening so that she's, because I think she'll, she'll love that and uh, the others too, the fly. That's wonderful. Well, if you don't have any more questions um, on that, I mean, you you obviously um, do get in touch with us if you think of anything later, but um, it is a lovely poem. Thanks, Atlas. It is a lovely poem. But I just want to say a big thank you to you all uh, for taking part in this series of webinars. It's been a real revelation to me, not being a poet. Um, uh, the standard of the the work that you've done in in you know quite challenging circumstances in a sense having to do it in chat and it is quite a clunky bit of technology although it does work very well um, but I really want to thank you very much and also to thank um, uh, the teachers who've been involved and um, because it's quite a big commitment for them too so thanks to you all for taking part so um, elegantly and intelligently and creatively it's been absolutely amazing it's been wonderful it's been a real privilege i have to say yeah. it really has so yeah so we really enjoyed it um we will be in touch needless to say they will be looking for feedback from you and um i hope um i just had i, I bought a, a broom the other day and i've just had an, a request from sainsbury's to uh, review my broom um and i'm not <laughs> going to do that but um so this I, I hate to think that we sound as if we're doing that but uh, it would be great to hear what you liked about the course, what you would have liked more of, what you might have liked less of, um, because um, we, we certainly hope that they will run this the, the course again next year. But it always helps to get input from people who've taken part. Um, so we will be in touch uh, in the usual way about that. Um, but it's been a great pleasure. We really enjoyed it. We're going to miss it next Wednesday evening. It's going to seem very empty, very empty. Um, Catherine, anything you want to add? I think you've covered it absolutely perfectly. Yes, I think that's it. As I say, if, if no one has any other, other questions, um, I mean, I really do hope that you are all going to be submitting your work. I think it would be a, a great shame if you didn't, but I'm sure you will be. Um, yeah. And it's just wonderful to have 
spent this time with you all for it really has been it's been wonderful yeah. thoroughly enjoyable and yeah great great well we'll liberate you all now into the dark cold night <laughs> Um, and thanks again. Congratulations to you all. And uh, we look forward to, we are sure we are going to hear more from you in due course. Okay. Lovely. So bye-bye, everybody. Bye for now. Bye.